RV channel. My name is Colin and you may or may not know me from doing the a Mountain Bikers Perspective reviews on uh, different RVs in this same class or on the Grey Wolf Bike channel where I tend to post most often. Nevertheless, in this video, we're going to be talking about this, the 2024 Winnebago 2108 FBS FLX. And this is not any regular FBS FLX. This is my FBS FLX. So stick with me. So this video is titled 12 things I hate about my 2108 FBS FLX. But I do want to lay some groundwork first. First and foremost, I fully acknowledge it's easier to criticize something after the fact that it is to design it, anticipating all the sort of needs and wants of multiple different demographics and user groups. However, I have some thoughts about this trailer in particular and how it fits in Winnebago's lineup and potential for even something else to sit alongside this, but those thoughts will be kept for a future video. Instead, I'm going to try to maintain these criticisms in context with what this product is and the user group that it intends to, or I believe that Winnebago intends to market it towards. Moreover, as a consumer, first and foremost, at this time of video recording, I don't have any official relationship with Winnebago, although I would love for that to change in the future. Nevertheless, I find criticisms often more valuable than the praise because if you as the consumer, as the viewer, are simply watching this video and you don't agree with a single thing that I say, that's awesome because then that means that there's a high likelihood that you're really going to like this product. So. I am going to try to be as objective as I can, as contextual as I can, but I'm also going to try to, uh, to be as honest and upfront as I can as well. And uh, we're going to start with number one right here in the front. So on the side, you can see that it says micro mini and there's this graphics package here and uh, they've got this topo pack uh, or on the standard 2108 FBS, the non-FLX version, all of these graphics are a black and white, which is really quite nice and contemporary. Similarly, on the side, black and white, there is no green. The green comes when you opt for the FLX package. Now, I'll show you in a minute the graphic on the back of this trailer, which uh, I think really epitomizes things. Nevertheless, this to me is, I really don't like it. First and foremost, green topographic lines just doesn't make sense. I have taken some cartography classes in the past and, you know, I'm cool with the color inverse of the uh, the white topo on black, but the green's just unnecessary. And uh, and it's not just the topo lines here and it's not just the trim along there. It's all over the trailer with the micro mini and the green banding and and the logo again we'll see on the back of the trailer. I have a good analogy for, but we're going to have to pop over and see our friends at Cam Clark Ford Airdrie first to uh, show you what I mean. So let's go do that and then we'll come back to the trailer. All right, so we've come over to our friends here at Cam Clark Ford Airdrie and I'm standing next to a brand new 2023 Ford F-150 XLT. One thing that this truck has that is the reason why we're standing next to it is this is equipped with the power boost, which means this is the hybrid. So you have the standard engine coupled to a hybrid system so that this truck's going to have the power takeoff, the big built-in battery in the back with the big inverter and the power ports at the back. I, I hope you're picking up on what I'm alluding to here big battery, independent battery takeoff, that sort of thing. This is an optional accessory package. And yet what Ford didn't do is they didn't force you into, you know, having green wheels or a green grill or any other feature in the back. Instead, they've given you a nice badge to share with others that, yeah, actually you have the hybrid with the big battery, with the big inverter in the back that you can go and, you know, run your camper off grid. In fact, keep an eye out for a video in the future where maybe we power the, uh, the 2108 FBS FLX from a power boost. How cool would that be? So yeah, dream scenario, right? Nevertheless, this, I think, is how marketing and branding is done right. They haven't forced the consumer into anything that they didn't want, but they've allowed a nice, tasteful way of distinguishing one product from another in the line. So 
for that, we're going to go back to the trailer and uh, finish up this video. So we're back here at the trailer, and uh, I wanted to finish up this whole graphics rant with this logo right here. Speaking of Winnebago, the meaning behind this logo is to be unplugged around the globe. And that is in reference to the 400 watts of solar, the 320 amp hour lithionics battery, and the 3000 watt Xantrax inverter charger. Being that you are capable of using this trailer to its full capacity without any shore hookups whatsoever. And that's incredible. But the logo they've chosen to uh, represent that is an earth being strangled by a power cord. And not even a grounded power cord. Where's the ground prong? I digress. This, I think, misses the mark and I don't find to be particularly aesthetic, even if I do understand what it means. So, like I say, to wrap up this rant, it's simply that just because I want a trailer with increased capability and functionality doesn't necessarily mean that I want to advertise its green qualities literally and figuratively i think the black and white graphics are you know sharp and contemporary and suit really well on this white color that we've seen here now on the winnebago micro mini products of the last few years and uh, and i'd really prefer that it didn't have that there is the uh, flx uh, graphic that uh, you may be able to see up here on the side and i think that that's more than sufficient and okay fine if they want to hit it with a little green in the flx okay uh, life is about compromise but um but i would really prefer that the whole trailer were not clad in green graphics i don't have to move far thankfully for the next thing that i hate about this trailer and that's this guy right here so one of the amazing features that this trailer has is goodyear wrangler all-terrain TA tires on the drive wheels with magnesium rims. Even if I don't particularly like the magnesium wheels, so be it. The spare, however, though, this is a Westlake mounted to a steel wheel. Now, I love a black wheel, and I think this looks great. In fact, I prefer an all-black wheel over a black and chrome wheel that this trailer has. Nevertheless, this is your lifeline, the spare tire. And it's amazing that it's mounted back here. You're not crawling around on the ground, whatever. Awesome. However, Westlakes on the internet have established a bit of a reputation for exploding. And thus, I don't have a high degree of confidence with this. And I know there's always opportunities for compromise. So if you feel differently about this, hit, hit me up in the comments down below and tell me that I'm totally out to lunch. But I think if I am on a trip, you know, to Alaska or the Yukon, or I'm up on the side of a mountain and it's pouring rain and 6 p.m. on a Sunday when everything's closed, and I rip out a sidewall on a sharp rock, I want to have a Goodyear Wrangler back here that's going to give me that full confidence that I can just go home and that I'm not looking for the first available opportunity to put this back as being a spare tire. The steel wheel, okay, fine, so be it. It doesn't exactly give off the same aesthetic standards as the rest of the trailer, but steel wheel, I think, is more than sufficient for a spare tire. A lot of people are going to put this under a travel cover. I don't quite like travel covers myself. I'd rather see the cool, rugged aesthetic of the tire, but I would much prefer this to be a good Wrangler like the other main wheels. So that's something I'd like to see changed in the future, even if the externalized cost onto the customer, if it's 75 bucks, oh, take my money. I'd much rather pay $75 up front or $100 or whatever it looks like for a Goodyear Wrangler tire than um, be stuck on the side of the road when everything's closed. So yeah, I think that's a no-brainer in my opinion. Let's keep going. Just like the graphics and spare tire, we don't have to go too far to see the next thing that I hate about this trailer. And unfortunately, this one I think really impacts a lot of people. Now, what are we looking at here? Well, we have some satellite and part cable hookup. We'll get to that later. Down here, we have our black tank flush and we have our city water connection. We also have our shower behind this thin plastic door. Winnebago on their motorhome products use a system called a Nautilus system. What that is, is that is kind of like a main interface that has some uh, you know knobs and sort of switches, but uh, it takes 
these things, as well as the freshwater gravity fill, which is on the complete opposite side of the trailer than, uh, than, than the city water and the black tank flush, and it integrates it into a really nice control panel, but it has added features like the ability to siphon from a tank. So if we consider the standard non-flex version that doesn't even come with a battery from factory, it's fair to say that the intended consumer for that product is someone who is going to be camping almost exclusively in a powered hookup site. But the FLX, you're saying, you know, with these off-road capable tires, with the, the torsion spring independent axles, with the high ground clearance uh, frame, you're going places likely that are not going to have any hookups. And yet, the, there's only two ways to fill this trailer in those situations. One is with a city water connection, which obviously you're not going to have. And two, it's gravity feed on the other side. And with the gravity feed, you're standing there with, you know, jugs and you would need multiple jugs. I mean, I can't remember the exact liter that the freshwater tank is here. I think it's something around 125 liters. That's what, five, six of those giant blue water jugs. I mean, that's a lot of back and forth. You're just not going to be doing that or you're not going to be carrying around six jugs of water to be able to fill it up. What you might be though is near a stream or near a, a, a waterway so I can envision driving up the forest service roads in British Columbia and uh, and quite literally throwing a hose from the side of my trailer down into um, you know into that fresh glacial running water and using that siphon function you know to pull it up into the trailer but I can't do that with this it's either gravity fed or city water and to me that's just a really big disappointment because quite frankly it's actually one of my sources of anxiety for how i'm going to maintain water because i'd like to use this trailer for five even ten days off grid in fact there's a, a running saying in the rv community is you'll run out of water before you'll run out of battery well if we're going to run out of water let's at least have a way to fill it up and uh, and that would be you know with use of that nautilus system so that it has that siphon function for those who are wondering my understanding is um it essentially just uses your standard water pump but kind of in reverse in a sense where it can pull and it will suck from a tank into that uh, into that fresh holding tank so i'd much rather see that moreover the nautilus systems uh, depending which variant have a nice integrated shower and so they're intended to be mounted from an interior compartment with use of standard baggage doors, where this shower, this is just a really cheap plastic and uh, has no insulating properties whatsoever. So for me, I'm already concerned that I might uh, crack some of these fittings or fixtures in here if I'm doing any winter camping, even if I'm in a, in a park where I have the city water hookup and I'm plugged into shore power and I have a trip like that coming up soon. If I wanna rinse off my mountain bike at the end of the day, I don't know how I'm going to drain this, like with the water out of the hose in the shower here. So if I had that Nautilus, it would at least be behind closed doors and be passively heated from the inside. I think that was a really big missed opportunity for Winnebago. And uh, I even have kind of a proposed plan for how we could uh, add that on in, you know, in future iterations of this, uh, this model by uh, moving some cost allocations around. But we'll get to that in a minute. All right, keep moving. Ooh, getting old. So moving up to the front of the trailer, we can see my next point of criticism, and that's these windows, which if you've seen the 12 things that I love about this trailer, you're thinking, well, Colin, you said that you love how bright and spacious it feels, and I absolutely do. However, in a trailer that is capable of doing extended season camping, your greatest source of heat loss is going to come from the windows. And that's not unique to RVs. That's the same with residential as well which is why we have dual pane windows in residential. But even though Winnebago has dual pane as an upgrade option on some of their other mobile products, what I would love to see on this product is the dual pane, I think it's like a, what is it? Lexan or plexiglass, that sort of thing. It's a, the plastic windows. You might know them as those Euro style windows. And those windows are really common on the like super off-road, like drag down, you know, Hell's Gate and Moab Trail kind of trailer with big fancy articulating hitches and 12 inch air ride suspension. And that's not where this product sits. But I would love to see if they're gonna use this traditional style to have a dual pane option, 
But in a perfect world, I'd love the big plexi windows. The reason being is that on this style window, it gets broken up into multiple different panes. You know, you have bug knitting on one side, not on the other, which kind of tricks the mind into thinking the window is a lot smaller than what it is. Whereas those Euro windows tend to be a lot more thermally efficient. And if you can hear the highway behind me, a lot more sound resistant as well. So from uh, from a perspective of a trailer having lots of windows, it would be great to know that this is not going to be a source of heat loss, but rather this would be uh, more protected against that. So dual pane windows. And don't take my word for it. Winnebago actually published an article on their own website back in 2018 uh, titled something like uh, dual pane acrylic windows, why it's a must have on your RV. So in the RV line, they know about this technology much the same as that Nautilus system. It just has not made its way over quite yet to their towable products. And that's something I'd like to see change because I don't love that. At least the option of it. Come on, give me the option. All right, so we're now coming around to the entrance, the passenger side of the trailer. And what we see here is uh, quite frankly, a liability. <laughs> so if you're driving down a trail, the one thing that you want to try to do with any rocks, obstacles, stumps, that sort of thing, is you want to align that with your tires as opposed to having it centralized where you could hang up on it. You'd rather roll over it than, than hang up on it, to a certain extent at least. I'm not a professional off-roader, so don't take uh, you know me as a source of professional advice. <laughs> Nevertheless, this is hanging out pretty far. In fact, I think it might even technically be beyond the edge of this trailer. Okay, sure, you know, if you're getting that close, you're, you know, you've got bigger problems, but if you look at it in relation to this tire, it is totally reasonable to think if this trailer was articulating through something, we might hang up on these steps. I wish it ended there, but it doesn't. Now, opening these steps are, is fairly straightforward. You just pull it, kind of drops down into its place really nicely, and it flips down. Great. These are actually really quite steady. Sometimes those triple steps can feel a bit springy and not good. These feel good. They even have like a, a skateboard style grip texture on it. Good stuff. However, not so good when you go to fold it up because you can see here it's already stuck in position. So you kind of have to, there you go, knock it down. Then you can fold it up and you think, oh, I can just push it up in. Nope. What you have to do is come underneath, pinch and lift like, like this, rock it up and in and then put it in. That's not very premium feeling. There is a solution. There are, I think a couple of companies, I know Lippert for one makes one, it's called like the steady step. And it basically is this big step that folds down. It makes contact with the ground, but versions of it do have easily adjustable leg feet. So when this trailer goes into the inevitable off-road locations, this style step is actually good because you're not reliant upon even and level ground to make this stable. That is inherently built into the design. But as we can see, it's not great to begin with. So if those are going to fold down, as long as it was using one that had those independently adjustable legs, that would be great. A counterpoint to those flip, dial, flip down style steps, though, is that if they're dirty and muddy, then you're flipping it up and into the trailer. So you would have to sweep and brush them off prior to changing destinations. But from experience, I was driving this down the road through a snowstorm, needed to get into my trailer. So guess what? All of that snow, grime, debris, mud, dirt, everything, just completely from the tow vehicle and from the tires right here, filled these steps up already. My hands were covered in mud. And if I had that steady step that flipped out from inside the trailer, I would not have had that problem to begin with. So. These steps, don't love them. All right, so stepping into the trailer, we can see we have our like electronics control system here. For more information, definitely go and check out the deep dive series where I go through each different system in this trailer in greater detail to give you an understanding of kind of the nuance in operation. Again, these videos are more of a high level overview. Nevertheless, 
Up top, we see the GoPower MPPT solar remote. This is what's monitoring our solar input. Down here, we can turn on our Xantrax inverter charger panel. And then down here, we kind of have the Winnebago control center. To manage the different systems on this trailer, we have GoPower, Xantrax, Lithionics from the battery. In addition to this, we also have the Truma electronic control unit back there. That's going to control your air conditioner, your heater, and your water pump. So if you intend on adding a DC to DC charge controller to charge that big battery while you're driving down the road, hint, hint, future video, that will be with a Victron Energy. That means that we have a GoPower, Xantrax, Lithionics, Truma, and GoPower, five different brands. And all of them have their own proprietary apps because why wouldn't they? That's too many in my opinion, especially when you also have the Winnebago hard control center here to turn on, you know, the lights and things. I'm sure that's done from a cost perspective where maybe Winnebago, you know, will get a deal on the solar panels if they use the GoPower MPPT charge controller. Maybe Xantrax was, you know, kind of the best price at the time for an inverter charger. But for the last couple of years, I was using Victron Energy. And while they basically don't seem to have any customer service to speak of, they also make MPPT charge controllers and inverter chargers, etc. So if Winnebago was to consider in the future moving to maybe one specific supplier for those key components, we wouldn't have a system where up here the Go Power is telling us the battery voltage, but then the Xantrax is telling us the battery voltage. But but the Lithionics app that tells us the battery voltage, and I don't need it three different spots from three different apps and also i've seen where they aren't exactly most accurate the battery is going to tell you exactly what its voltage is the lithionics i trust that a lot more than i trust these two so simplifying the number of electronic components down would be i think an improvement or something maybe for future videos is a more integrated one-stop shop let's call it information center where it could more effectively utilize these multiple different brands that would be another solution but that's a story for another day in the meanwhile let's press on as we make our way into the trailer we can see the next thing that i don't love and that is this mattress for a few different reasons one rv mattresses are notoriously not awesome this is a approximately six inch feels like a coil sprung mattress you would probably be best to look at uh, some other options which gosh i keep saying future videos but there's a future video for this as well nevertheless that's not my issue with it it's that it this is a 60 by 74 queen mattress otherwise known as a rv queen a residential queen is 60 by 80 meaning this is six inches shorter does six inches make a difference yeah actually it does a lot of people will get into rvs they'll lay down they're like oh this is wonderful but they're not doing that with a pillow the pillow is going to space that person down at least about a foot depending on uh, your, your sleeping habits and how tall you are and even myself at five foot nine or about 172 centimeters on a rv queen my toes do hang off the end now there is solutions to that so under here we can see this piece of plywood is the top for the underbed storage and what you can simply do is cut a new piece of plywood that is six inches longer if you were going to invest in a 60 by 80 mattress ah, future video so that is an easy solution but what that will inherently do is encroach in on your entryway space by six inches which leads me to the next thing that i not in love with about this trailer and that's the overall length i love this trailer in terms of its layout orientation and size whatever and i would love it even more if this space didn't change but it had a 60 by 80 true proper queen mattress however it doesn't 
So six inches longer would mean that we would need to extend the trailer six inches that way. That's going to increase the tongue weight, but actually it's quite light as it is. I believe the FLX has a rated tongue weight of 475 pounds dry from Winnebago, and the non-FLX, which doesn't have that big battery, is even less, I think closer to the 425 pound tongue weight. Those are really light for a 21 foot trailer that weighs about, I think, 4,400 pounds. Six inches will also help out in two other ways. One, that pass-through storage compartment, you lose about six inches to the Lithionix battery and Dantrax inverter. And six inches longer would actually essentially restore that length and give you a much you know, more spacious pass-through. So while I have a F-150 pickup truck where I can throw a lot of stuff into the bed, if you're towing it, say, with a Ford Expedition or uh, like a GMC Yukon or something like that, you may not want to have a lot of those items in your vehicle. You'd prefer to put them in that garage uh, pass-through storage. And uh, that's where that space, I think, would really be beneficial. So I alluded earlier when talking about this Winnebago control center here that the entry light switch was going to play into a future point of criticism. And that is because the two lights above the bed, the light here above the dining area, the light here in the kitchen, and this light back here are all independently controlled, actually as well as these two, by push buttons, which is fine because what that allows you to do is go around the coach and you know create the exact amount of zone lighting that you'd like there we go um including this one uh however there is also another switch back here for the one above the sink i guess because it's a bit of a reach not really sure why but having all of these lights on individual press toggles uh, doesn't really feel as sort of luxurious as the rest of the trailer. It's not a big trailer, that's fine, I get that, but it would be nice, you know, if there was like a little toggle somewhere or on like a main central control panel where you can just come in and be like, I want these lights on, these lights off, etc. Especially the ones above the bed. There's no under cabinet accessory lighting, so I would love little accessory lights or reading lights because, you know, let's say you're all tucked in, all you want to do is roll over and turn off the light. Well, can't really do that. You got to, you know, get out of the covers and climb up and hit it on the ceiling. So I think the opportunity for, you know, light switches, it's an added cost. Again, you know, these are the things that add up, right? It's the switch assembly, it's the wiring, it's the labor to do it. But that is something that I feel I would be more inclined to pay for. I haven't got, uh, you know, any camping trips yet in this particular trailer. So maybe this won't bother me as much as, uh, as I think that it does. But, uh, but my first thought is, um, you know, I would wish that there was a bit more centralization in terms of switches. And there is a cool solution to that, which again, topic for a future video. So next up on the list is a really unfortunate one. And I'll admit it does kind of straddle the categories between design and craftsmanship. What's important to understand here is on the non FLX models, there is a different style of air conditioner where I believe non FLX has a Dometic unit. Could be wrong about that. Someone can correct me in the comments down below. However, on the FLX, you get the upgraded Truma Aventa Eco. This has a much lower amperage draw. So as a reminder, this Lithionix battery and Xantrax 3000 watt inverter is wired to the entire trailer. So just like you can run the microwave, you can also run the air conditioner exclusively off that battery, which is incredible. However, the Aventa Eco has a much wider shroud to it. And somehow, despite Winnebago producing 1,200, actually more than 1,200 FLX models, I was the first to let them know that this cupboard hits. Speaking with the towables director, he did go down, he did verify it on the line that this has always existed this way. And I'm told that they are going to be implementing a running change moving forward in the future where they're going to actually shift the opening where this mounts to and all the structural support over to the driver's side such that you can have appropriate clearance for this door. Because I'll admit, I'm human. 
even though I know that this is built according to its design and is a problem, I have repeatedly already hit this such that it's actually already starting to show little chips and wear on the corner. Now, to make matters worse, there is very little opportunity to actually add any protection and I'll give you a close-up view in a second because if you were to mount something on the face here well it's going to be facing this way and not be the point that makes contact but come on and I'll give you a closer look here. So having a closer look here at the side of the air conditioner shroud you can see that there is this very thin like clear whitish plastic mesh it's i think just more for aesthetics than it has any particular function to it and then this very small rounded edge here now if we were to open the door to illustrate where the point of contact is you can see it's right where i have this little sticky and the problem is that you can't really put one of those round like gummy door stopper things because there's not a flat surface there's really not much of a perch here at all but at the same time, you know, you can see here that uh, what I have is, is not even quite substantial enough. So if you can think of any solutions, please leave a link in the comment down below. Uh, I would greatly and sincerely appreciate that. However, in the meanwhile, this is what it is. So on to the next thing that I don't love about this trailer. And it's that there's no dedicated pantry to keep food. Where do you keep your food? Well, if it were up to me, I would assume that these cupboards here would be for cups, plates, bowls, coffee mugs, you know, wine glasses, etc. You know, I'm just used to reaching up and grabbing those sorts of things. So, okay, let's rule that one out. We have two drawers down here, which I would interpret for, you know, cutlery and cooking instruments like spatulas and strainers and that sort of thing. So, okay, not there which leads us over to this cupboard and this situation. So here we have a single cupboard that ends right flush with this line. So it's not the biggest cupboard by any means, and you're most certainly not getting a bag of chips in there. This for me would be like a cool little candy cupboard. This is where the marshmallows and the graham crackers and the, the chocolate bars go. So, all right, that's you know for sweets, especially if you have a little one that's sleeping there, which, leads us back to here this well this cupboard is as deep as you can see here with exception of the uh, the bottom so this would seem like your natural fit for a cupboard but you're going to have to invest in some bins and because there is a trim around here you know the 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 door opening the orifice here it's not that big despite it being quite deep so if you're adding bins there's going to be a built-in loss of efficiency because now you're going to have to account for a smaller bin so i think you're just going to end up putting everything in here loose there's two shelves here like i said there's one in the bottom there's a pipe almost immediately there this is kind of not really um you know uh, that great but what I could love seeing Winnebago to do is instead of having this be a swing out door, move the handle down into a centralized position and have this be a pull out pantry with a solid back so things don't fall out. But imagine you could have a pull out that would come out to say about here and then you would have the two big shelves and then you could throw, you know, stuff maybe in, you know, there'd be a smaller shelf or something like that that would go in there like a half shelf. And this is where you could, I think, have nice, easy access. So if I'm over here, you know, doing my cooking, I can pull this out and I can say, okay, I need, you know, uh, a, th a tin of uh, beans and, and a container of rice or, you know, whatever that looks like in a three-tiered, um, you know, pantry because I don't love the idea of having to dig all the way back into it. Alternatively, and perhaps even in addition to this modification, right beneath you, there is storage under the seating here. Now, this side, there is a small obstruction, so you wouldn't be able to do it here, but on that side, you could again have a full pull out drawer where you could even have you know the opportunity to add dividers to keep things from sort of sloshing about and I think that would significantly increase your comfort in being able to cook inside the unit so the lack of a dedicated storage pantry certainly plays into that especially when I turn my focus up here 
So outside, when we were talking about the water services management, I was kind of giving like a estimated breakdown in probability or percentage rather of how the different classes of consumers for the non FLX versus the FLX would use these trailers. I personally believe that the non FLX would be like a 90, 10. That's 90% of the time they're camping with hookups, whether that's, you know, here in Canada, traditionally just electricity on site down state side, you're going to see things like on site city water hookup, dare I say, in some situations, even cable TV hookups here in Canada, all that stuff is kind of unheard of. With the FLX, I would put forth that distribution is more like a 60-40. 60% is probably looking to use this trailer off-grid and not with any services or hookups. And 40% of the time, you know, with hookups. So, you know, still keeping, you know, the ability to plug into shore power, obviously, but, uh, but not also needing and recognizing the need for equipment like large lithium-ion batteries and big power inverters, etc. So when Winnebago has made the decision to take away cupboard and storage space in the interest of adding this JBL head unit to power two interior speakers above you and two exterior speakers, I really start to question things because as a consumer, all of these pieces of equipment and wiring and, you know, for the different zones and all that stuff is passed along to you, the consumer. You're paying for this stuff. And to me, I much value a pantry space, especially given what we just talked about up here, over a radio system that has about the same audio quality as an elevator. To me, this is like a legacy feature carried over from like the mid 90s when that was considered important. But I would even, you know, go so far as to say it, you know, in support of it, that if you are looking for a trailer where you can do some of that like tailgating at the football games, again, that's not something we ever do here in Canada. It's very, uh, you know, American, but I've seen it, looks fun. You know, you are the kind of person who wants that full exterior kitchen with, you know, a separate bar fridge for drinks and the flip up big screen TV outside where you guys are going to, you know, rally around. And so you want those integrated stereo speakers. In fact, a lot of the um, like grand design in their momentum series, they've got like 10 inch subwoofers that they've built into it. A lot of those toy haulers now are doing like with flip down balconies, you know, using the, uh, the, uh, the loading ramp for a dual purpose. And, and that's super fun for that class of trailer I would put forth none of that is applicable here if you are the kind of person that you want to go into the back country and experience nature you're probably not the kind of person who's wanting to you know turn on a bunch of music and potentially impact other people's experience trying to utilize that same area as well so non-essential electronics is my absolute number one thing that i hate about this trailer because not only am i paying for this head unit and four speakers as described i'm paying for a television all right that's fine i mean there are smart tvs i don't believe this is one of them but i'm also paying for coaxial hookup for um you know being in a in a park that has cable tv services so show me that situation i think where you need a 3000 watt standalone power inverter and a $5,000 Canadian 320 amp hour lithium ion battery with built in heater, but yet you've got satellite hookups, not satellite, cable TV hookups. Like I don't get that. And yet I am still paying for all of this electronics. It goes even worse than that because this last one down here says it's prepped for King Air TV or Wi-Fi or whatnot. Now, I've done a bit of research. It's a multi-hundred dollar piece of equipment that sits about right here on the roof. And what they're promoting is you can get a SIM card and put that in that device and it will create like a, you know, Wi-Fi on board. What happened to just hotspotting from your phone? And yet I, I, as a consumer, have paid hundreds of dollars for that hardware, which most of the areas I'm in, cell phone uh, reception is not <laughs> that great. In fact, I would much rather have the hookups for a Starlink, which 
Interestingly enough, I can't help but notice Winnebago at this time of recording does have one official Towables product brand ambassador and he this year had Starlink installed on his trailer as well. I also noticed that his trailer had the steady step. So I feel like I'm probably not alone in a lot of this feedback. Now the TV, this is one that I wax and wane on. My first thoughts in getting this is this is going to be the first thing that's going out the door. But in the interest of fairness, if this was a smart TV, there's actually really nice sight lines from the two seats there. So I can kind of envision myself, you know, prepping dinner, having a guest sitting there, you know, maybe having like the Red Bull Rampage replay, you know, on here or something like that. I'm most certainly, even though it's visible from the bed, you know, it would be much smaller. And I think that people would generally speaking, would be more apt to just having their iPad or laptop sit on their lap and, you know, watch a movie in bed. Call me crazy. But here's a thought. Why not just have a television as a optional accessory add-on? Or similarly, if you really want those speakers, but an alternative to those speakers that one um, brand uh, Ibex is doing is they're including a waterproof JBL speaker. And like, to me, I think that's perfect because if you want music, a JBL speaker has great sound quality, uh, but you can bring it farther away from the trailer. So if you're camping, you could bring it down to, you know, the rocky shore or the beach with you or whatever. So instead of paying for all this integrated technology, you know, again, that could be another optional accessory. You could call it, you know, the remote audio package or something like that. So yeah unnecessary electronics in these trailers is I think my number one because I would much rather instead of the TV and the head unit and the satellite thing the King Air Bluetoothy whatever I would much rather have a Nautilus system where I can siphon fresh water into my tanks through the pump in the remote areas that I'm operating in. I'd much rather put that towards dual pane acrylic windows to increase the thermal efficiency and extend the capabilities of this trailer. I'd much rather have that money be dedicated to increasing the capabilities than catering to what I argue are legacy features. All right, so that is the end of the things that i don't love about this trailer do i hate them obviously not enough to stop me from buying it do i wish things were different sure absolutely and is this video intended to both help you in your purchasing decision give you some things to think about and will definitely be emailed over to winnebago you betcha so my goal here is not only to help you as the consumer go through the considerations that I went through and some of the things that I have maybe thought of in regards to this product, but it's to help Winnebago actualize the best pr product or version of this product that they can. So if you agree with me, please let me know in the comments down below. If you disagree with me, definitely let me know in the comments down below. Just be kind. Nevertheless, thank you very much for watching. I sincerely do appreciate it. I hope you found this video helpful. And if you're interested in mountain biking content, be sure to make your way over to the Grey Wolf Bike channel as well. And uh, I will actually, I do promise to make an effort to produce some ski related content on the Grey Wolf Ski channel as well. In the meanwhile, thank you very much for watching. You take care and bye for now.